seven. Yeah. So um, Casey contacted me uh, quite a few years ago, um, you know, thinking about our grad student program, and um, we didn't have any funding at that time. And uh, but Casey's Casey's CV was um, difficult to join program student excellence. So uh, he came from Florida Gulf Coast University, um, where he had uh, a bachelor's in both biology and anthropology, so double major, as well as minors in chemistry and software engineering. So pretty uh, impressive resume right there. And, and um, he, his advisor, I remember, noted in the, uh, one of the reference letters that he had built the seawater system that they were using by himself. So he kind of put that together. I said, wow, this guy is like computers, chemistry, biology, he's like perfect. Uh, and so when this, um, when we had a grant roll around for um, ocean acidification and squid, which he is sort of interested in cephalopods. Sort of. Uh, <laughs> uh, I contacted Casey, and he had just started a grad program with Michael Berubin for a master's degree. Some of you may know Michael was, uh, spent some time here as a postdoc at Simon Thurl. Thur Thur and so I uh, emailed Mike, and then we kind of back and forth, and we got actually an opportunity to get Casey to do um, part of his master's research out here as well. So we got new Casey for a bonus year um, as well. So it's been just, we've got a chance to work with him for a long time. Just a little bit about his um, interest. Um, there are ecophysiology, stress physiology, integrated biology, zooarchaeology, which is early Greek, as well as science communication, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, he's got um, several publications. Uh, to date now, three publications. We've got another one submitted. We've got a couple more that he's just getting close to submitting. He's been able to raise some of his own funding here as well, including a few Hampton Young Fellowship and a Midland Foundation Fellowship uh, for some of his outreach activities. And he's you know, a big proponent of, um, uh, he's done a lot of the science presentations, over 17 different science presentations as a first author, um, as well as, as things like putting code out there. Um, uh, and GitHub, which I think is a pretty important thing as well, so he's really sharing his methods. Um, Some of you may know Casey, he has a, um, just from, uh, he is quite recognizable, and these are sort of the many faces of, of Casey Zakharov. These are what you sort of can find uh, on, the, on the web, but he's a really sort of uh, talented and, and vibrant, vibrant person. Um, and as I mentioned, I just kind of want to relay, you know, he had a lot of has a, had a lot of science success, which I'll talk to you today, but you probably, if you know Casey, he's had a lot of um, success from, from an outreach perspective as well. And so just, I kind of wanted to hi highlight some of that because he's not going to highlight it as much today. But this is, he has a very uh, vibrant Twitter account. That character is, is, is part of his Twitter account. Um, he's given lectures to, uh, this is more of a public sepulchral um, meeting and, and, and publication. So he's integrated with them as well. Uh, He's worked on this. So this is this is a, a paralarval squid um, that you that you'll see some more of today. But that is actually a drawing of a paralarval squid. So um, Casey's worked with artists in what's called the circle of life, where they're kind of drawing different animals, um, and he worked with their with them to kind of illustrate the larval squid. Um, this is not Casey's book, but he's working on a uh, comic book um, by Science Comics, which you may sort of know this feed. Uh, and so he's working on one, one about whales, actually, right now, um, which is nearing, nearing completion. Uh, he's done a, a video here um, with, uh, with what's called the Water Brothers and on ocean acidification that we we're, that we we're part of. And he was speaking, I would say, better than I am about ocean acidification. Um, he, uh, let's see, has, <laughs> has a podcast uh, with Andrew Slump, who's here in the audience as well. He's been has several podcasts out, science podcasts, um, and then I think one of the most impressive things is here is this is Casey right here working with several students from Perkins School for the Blind, and he's he's uh, helping and has really helped develop a uh, comic book essentially for um, for the blind. So it's 3D and has Braille integrated into it. And it's a really impressive product, um, and you should ask him about it and and see it. So he's he's impressive in a lot of the ways. Um, he's really got some really kind of diverse. Alex here, but then at the same time, he's going to tell you about his cool science. So, um, without further ado, uh, Casey Zakharoff. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, Aaron. That was awesome. <laughs> 
Oh, that disappeared. There we are. Ooh. All right. Hi. My name is Casey Zakroff. I've been working in the Mooney Lab for the better part of six years now, raising squid eggs under ocean acidification in order to look at their physiology, morphology, and behavior. So I'm going to talk you through that project today. Oh. So this is Dorotuthus peeli. This is the local Atlantic longfin squid. And if you're like me and some of the other cephalopod-minded people here, you, this is enough to be interested in. This is cool enough that I don't need to justify it anymore. But if you're working in a different system or need some other justifications, these types of coastal squids serve a really important role in nearshore food webs. So this is a similar squid. This is Logolico plea, which is uh, off the coast of Brazil. But you can see that in this diagram, uh, it eats a lot of sort of smaller fishes and itself, and then is feeding carbon up into larger uh, predators, charismatic megafauna. And this is the sort of central role that these squid play in maintaining our nearshore systems. Uh, they're also a growing fishery. Our specific uh, longfin squid fishery is about 24 million pounds as of last year, so it's a growing protein source for humans as well. Now, this species of squid comes in shore to Vineyard Sound every year uh, from about May to October to breed and lay its eggs. Um, and so we collect them here in the Menemsha Bight uh, through the MBL, and generally what you see these squid are about a year class species. They live for about a year, they'll mature, and if they breed in that, uh, at the end of that year, they die after breeding. If they don't manage to breed within that year, they can come back as two-year-olds um, and try again, but that's generally the maximum of their lifespan. So that's sort of the structure of this breeding population that we have coming through here. Um, but as they're going through this uh, colonial breeding aggregation behavior, they're leaving these huge mops of egg capsules tied to the benthos, sort of to their own devices, because they die shortly after successive bouts of breeding. Now, I'm an ecophysiologist. I'm interested in how animals deal with their environment, and in particular, how animals deal with stressors, whether they be natural or human-imposed. So for this PhD, the stressor of choice was ocean acidification. If you have not heard about ocean acidification, it is a process of uh, human-produced carbon dioxide in our atmosphere entering the ocean and making it more acidic. And it is a field of science that is full of jargon, and depending on how you view it, you use different terminology to discuss it. So I talk about uh, ocean acidification in terms of parts per million carbon dioxide, or the concentration of carbon dioxide in the seawater. Um, but you might think of acidity in terms of the pH scale, and I'm going to frame what we're seeing in ocean acidification over the course of this model from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change over this timeline, just to kind of couch uh, some references for you to kind of keep in mind through the rest of this talk. So right now, we're at an atmospheric concentration of about 400 parts per million, or an open ocean pH of about 8.1. So you can see that dot in green. The models, if we do not reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we're outputting, stick us at about 2100 uh, at the year 2100 at about 900 parts per million, or a pH of about 7.7. .7. And if we really don't do anything about carbon dioxide emissions, at the year 2300, we would be about 2,000 parts per million, or an open ocean pH of about 7.4. Um, so I want you to keep these parts per million numbers more in the framework of your mind, but I'll be using these colors to help associate to these sort of time points. Now, this is long-scale projections for open ocean, but coastal systems are actually acidifying much more rapidly. Uh, and this is due to a number of processes. One, freshwater input from rivers tends to lower the buffering capacity, so pH can be much more variable in coastal systems. And association with humans through activities, industrialization, pollution, can acidify the water through the influence of other chemicals as well. Um, so on short time scales, in certain particularly threatened coastal systems like the Gulf of Maine uh, and nearby regions, acidification can happen much more quickly, which is a concern because these habitats are really important for a number of animals that we really care about. These uh, nearshore services, uh, such as shellfish aquaculture, coral reefs, um, and a lot of nearshore habitat serves as nursery habitat for a lot of taxa. So we see impacts in things like urchins and corals, things that make calcium carbonate shells, like shellfish, 
And our concern is for some of these other organisms that maybe don't have these hard parts, but are laying their eggs, which we think might be potentially sensitive in these coastal systems, are they at risk? And since I'm interested in the squid, and these squid are leaving these eggs in these coastal systems, is this sort of foundation for this squid population potentially at risk by being left in these systems under these potential stressors? So I'm going to kind of walk through our system in diagrammed cartoon form, because Aaron has introduced that this is how I work. Um, so we have our breeding aggregation that lays eggs in those mops, and you can see that those individual egg capsules can each contain anywhere between 50 to a couple hundred eggs. Um, from an individual egg capsule's perspective, it's dealing with its environment. We're obviously interested in pH. Okay. So one of our committee members calling in. All right, that works. I'm sorry that the stream didn't work, Harry. Um, so we have environmental influence from pH, which we're immediately concerned about, but also influences of temperature, things like oxygen and salinity in the local environment. And all of this is impacting sort of the boundary layer of that egg capsule and the conditions that each individual embryo is experiencing. And so each individual egg or embryo is going to go through embryonic development, form its own little paralarvae. Um, and once it's developed, hatch out, and then they swim to the surface um, where I collect them and do studies on them. Um, and I'm going to be using this term paralarvae a lot. It's another sort of jargon term specific to the cephalopod world. Um, and all it means is that these are not like true larvae. They don't metamorphose. They aren't quite tiny exact versions of adult squid. They don't have those developed fins, but they can still swim by jetting, so they're not necessarily truly planktonic, so we're calling them paralarvae because they're kind of larvae. Now, in terms of experimental work, raising organisms under stressful conditions, there's only so much of this system that we can constrain. And so I can bring adults into the lab and get eggs, but primarily I'm raising eggs under some sort of controlled chemical conditions, leading them to hatch, and then I can deal with them in this sort of immediate hatchling paralarvae phase. Um, Beyond that, survival is very difficult. It's possible to culture these guys, but it is very challenging. So most of what I'm going to be talking about kind of focuses on this realm in terms of the experiments that I ran. And in particular, measurements usually run on day one hatchling paralarvae, after which they were anesthetized and preserved. So again, we're focusing on pH as a stressor in the system. And we want to think about how that could potentially impact the uh, biology of this squid embryo. So in terms of sort of energy input and energy output or a systematic kind of view of biology, these embryos only have one energy source. Their input is their maternal investment of yolk from their mother into their individual egg. And output-wise, they're developing new organ systems. They're growing. These are related processes, but they're not precisely the same and they're maintaining homeostasis, or they need to maintain the conditions in their body that allow for development and growth to proceed as needed. So when we add a stressor like pH to a system, that's affecting homeostasis. It's affecting intracellular pH, the ability for proteins to function appropriately. And in sort of a hypothetical framework, uh, we're expecting that if that stresses out the embryo, it's going to put more energy to homeostasis, right? But that energy has to come from somewhere. They're not eating, they're not consuming any more uh, energy. So they have to either tap an existing system or consume more of the available energy. So we could have a reduction in growth, in which case we can measure that in the hatchling paralarvae dorsal mantle length. We can have a reduction in development time, so slowing development, in which case we can measure hatching time. So we count all of the paralarvae as they hatch and see how long it takes. We can consume, the, the embryo can consume more yolk, in which case we can measure the hatchling yolk sac volume and see if there was more yolk consumed. Or if the stress is too much, the embryo might die, in which case we can measure the amount of successfully hatched paralarvae to the embryos that did not uh, survive embryonic development. And then we can measure that as a hatching, sex, uh, hatching success proportion. Blah, blah. So what work has been done uh, in 2011, a preliminary study done here raised uh, the squid's eggs under sort of ambient CO2 and then 2,200 parts per million CO2, so that's quite high. That's that beyond 2,300 uh, the year uh, from now 
um, and saw delays in hatching time, so that development impact, and smaller parallelity, so that mantle length, potentially growth impact. When I came in for my master's from Saudi Arabia uh, in 2013, the goal was to try and figure out where the threshold of that response was, to figure out what dosage of carbon dioxide causes those observable changes in the paralarvae. And essentially, the work from that year, that summer, saw effects emerging at 1,300 parts per million. Now, uh, work has been done since then in the Vulgaris, which is the European market squid, raising them in 1,650 parts per million, so fairly high. And there they saw, again, delayed hatching, so that's a consistent result, but a reduced embryonic survival, which was seasonally dependent. So this species, as opposed to ours, which has this one big breeding season, this species has a summer breeding season and a winter breeding season. And the summer season was the sensitive season. So there's some interesting potential for plasticity and variability that we hadn't really had the opportunity up until this point to describe and sort of coming into this full version of my PhD, the intent was to explore that more fully um, through sort of an integrative approach, looking at behavior, morphology, physiology, to try and figure out what are the mechanisms of acidification impacts, but also what kind of variability do we see in it? Is there uh, you know, outside influences on how acidification impacts uh, this squid? So I'm gonna go over the timeline of these experiments I'm incorporating the preliminary study here. So this is, on the x-axis, our CO2 concentrations. On the y-axis, we're looking at relative difference in mantle length for the year. So I'm basically just eliminating any trial-to-trial -trial differences, and we're looking at overall trends for the year. So in 2011, we saw that decrease in mantle length. When I came into the project in 2013, we again see that decrease in mantle length. And this not only comprised my master's, but also chapter two of my dissertation, where I dug back into this data much more deeply, uh, developed some new quantitative methods to an analyze it more robustly, and looked at much smaller scale variabilities. So I'll touch upon that a little bit. Um, now we also started doing behavioral work in 2013, and this was the uh, subject of my bio seminar, which some of you have attended. Um, so you'll have a little bit of spoilers as to what the kind of main uh, results or things I'm going to be talking about today are, but essentially one of the big hiccups of the behavior work was that we developed this new model system, this 3D recording system to record paralarvae in 2014 to really look at orientation and how these animals swam, and then we saw no effects of acidification. They, in fact, didn't really respond at all if there was a slight increase with acidification. And this was surprising, to say the least, as a first-year PhD student. Um, who was repeating his experiments and finding not the same results. Um, but we doubled down. We continued to try and figure out if that was a you know, true result by continuing into 2015. Again, we saw no effects, but we see a greater seasonal or clutch-to-clutch -clutch variability between trials in that year. And it's only in 2016 that we start seeing uh, impacts again. And so, really, while each of these individual years from 2013 to 2016 does have sort of smaller scale, hypothesis-driven experimentation going on, this overall large-scale temporal trend became one of the bigger drivers of my thesis, describing these interannual and seasonal variabilities and trying to determine what could be causing them. Um, and then because we had two years in 2014 to 2015 where we just weren't getting acidification responses even at our highest levels, in 2016, we also started doing multi-factor work, so we incorporated temperature as a potential additional stressor to really start seeing what the physiological capabilities of this developing squid egg system was. So if we put those, uh, so for the sake of this talk, most of what I'm gonna be talking about is the last two chapters, but we can put these chapters in context of that diagram and think about how those experiments functioned, and this will also serve as sort of the outline for the talk for the rest of this today. So. I am gonna to touch a little bit on chapter two, but very briefly, just to highlight those small scale variabilities that we see in this embryonic development system under pH. Um, I also wanna mention that I developed some more robust statolith analysis methods, and there's some other data sets involving statoliths that I talked about in my bio seminar, but haven't had the chance to complete yet, um, which feed into that swimming behavior work, which I presented as part of my bio seminar, uh, 
And that fed into a sensory sort of phototaxis uh, experiment, which I'm still processing with a student now. Um, so for the moment, we're going to ignore those. But that's all important, interesting context that just kind of got overwhelmed by this much more prominent interannual variability that I wanted to be able to describe. Um, so that kind of falls into this box of something going on beyond the scale of the individual eggs. We're looking at potential influences from the parents or the environment. And then we come back to sort of a synthesis in, in all of these ideas with an incorporation of temperature into this development system. All right, so how do we do this? Well, to begin with, we get our squid, as I said, from an Emsha bite. And this is the MBL Gemma. They go out and troll for squid. Um, they fish them up, and then we transport them up to the Environmental Systems Laboratory, where they go into our round tanks and are allowed to breed and lay eggs, which I will then collect and put in my acidification system. So this is all, again, that home-built uh, aquarium stuff there and needed from a student. But uh, we have these PVC uh, piping here, which are my uh, acidification equilibration chambers. So they're all bubbled with carbon dioxide, and the seawater passes through them to create our different acidification conditions. And then it moves into those manifolds that drips the seawater into the cups where the eggs are cultured in those controlled water baths. So in 2013, we did a range of CO2 levels between 400 and 2200. Um, and within a single water bath, each experimental cup had two egg capsules. Uh, we did three cups per treatment and then a control for seawater chemistry. And then we have three treatments per trial. So we have 18 egg capsules, a fairly robust system. And it's important to note that each trial had new squid, new parents, new eggs. So we're also uh, getting this changeover in parentage and season as we do trials throughout the year. Now they take about two weeks to develop at 20 degrees Celsius, which is the sort of mean temperature for vineyard sound over the breeding season. Uh, and then we, once hatching began, subsample our paralarvae for these morphology and physiology and behavioral analyses. So most of the uh, metrics that we're looking at are, again, of those day one hatchling paralarvae. Um, so starting with our data from our chapter two, you know, we're looking at where that dose started, the dose of acidification started impacting um, as we increase pH. But we're also interested in doing more experiments more robustly over the season and seeing if there's any variation as a result of parentage, maybe related to season, um, or at least seeing if response intensities change. So if we dive in, first what we notice is there's actually quite a lot of variability even within one trial. So this is the trial July 3rd, and I'll title trials by the day the eggs were laid. Um, so these are all eggs, uh, paralarvae from the July 3rd trial. And then this is looking at the mantle length, which we measure on that paralarvae there with that yellow line. Uh, so mantle length on the y-axis over the course of hatching. So we subsampled about 10 paralarvae per cup per treatment each of these six days. And we're looking at the means here with the uh, shape and shade being the acidification. So what you see is that what day we choose, or if we choose to integrate overall six days of hatching, affects the results that we see. Uh, we can say that there's an effect of acidification, but we can also see that that effect of acidification is being amplified over the course of hatching. Uh, it also gives us some insights into some physiological responses to look at these data. So we see in our 550, our light gray condition, that as hatching continues, they're continuing to get slightly larger, which if everybody's growing at the same rate, makes sense, because uh, they're just embryos that are continuing to grow over time. But under our acidification conditions, our best paralarvae are hatching first, and then we have sort of a lag in whatever paralarvae remain um, and are just getting out due to uh, whatever drives hatching. Um, if we look at yolk volume, so here we have a stained preserved paralarvae, and we're looking at the internal yolk. And so we have the uh, anterior yolk sac and posterior yolk sac that are measured here. You can see that in this case, the patterns are pretty similar to mantle length. And again, suggest that under acidification, these um, straggling paralarvae are much more strained as they're consuming more yolk relative to the control conditions over the course of hatching. Now, that's great for that one specific trial. 
Uh, so in July 3rd, we have that in, uh, decrease in mantle length, decrease in yoke volume, suggesting a pretty strained system under acidification. But we do not see those same responses in each trial of this year. So in the July 11th trial, we still have a pretty good or strong mantle length response, but yoke actually increases slightly with acidification, suggesting the possibility of a metabolic suppression. So they're smaller by result of growing slower and they're consuming less yolk because they're sort of just slowing down overall rather than shoving more energy into homeostasis. And then we have our August 7th trial. Sorry, I didn't explain what these plots are. On the y-axis is our yolk volume. On our x-axis is our mantle length. So comparing these allows us to kind of get at these physiological pictures. And then on our symbols, we're grading by uh, shading by acidification, so the darkness is higher acidification. Uh, so you see in this last trial that there's a little bit of a difference that's driven by some extreme values, but for the most part, the mantle length response is pretty low, and our yolk has flatlined, so there's no, no yolk response in this last trial, suggesting something that's approaching a form of resistance. Uh, so we have pretty strong shifts in response uh, type and potentially physiological strategy over the breeding season just in one year, which is quite interesting. But that doesn't preclude us from compiling that data and looking at overall trends. So here we have, again, that relative difference accounting for trial differences in mantle length over CO2. And we um, are doing a piecewise regression to really look at that stepwise response that's breaking pretty strongly at 1,300 parts per million. And that's supported as well by this ANOVA and Tukey's data represented by the letters, where you see that transition in the letters represent statistical groupings. So as we transition from that AB group to that CD group, we're really seeing that that's two solid groups around this response type, suggesting a stepwise response at 1,300 parts per million. Waha. So if we summarize for this chapter, we see that those acidifications emerged in this year at 1300, and we do have quite a lot of variability innate in the system within a clutch, across the days of hatching, as well as across clutches within a season. And so when we scale up now to start talking about these interannual and seasonal variabilities, they're perhaps not quite as surprising, but we still see them in ways that we hadn't expected kind of coming into it. So when we started seeing these resistant years um, we had to start thinking about variability on much larger timescales than we had originally anticipated and thinking about what is potentially driving that. Some change in either the condition of the parent and their ability to invest in their paralarvae or some changes in the environment, both, that are altering sensitivities. Um, and so the other thing I want to mention here is doing experiments for five years beyond the uh, sort of experimental response data, provides a lot more basic science data that otherwise might not have been explored. And one of the sort of major, in my opinion, um, discoveries from doing this for so long is that we start to see baseline state changes in the offspring that hadn't been described previously. And when we're trying to describe acidification impacts, if that baseline is shifting, this is an important thing to know. So on the y-axis here, we have relative difference in response in our control or lowest PCO2 condition. I say lowest PCO2 condition here because in our uh, preliminary study as well as my first summer here, the Environmental Systems Laboratory had some elevated PCO2s, so we didn't have a, a true 400 parts per million control for a little bit. So it's still effectively a control, but I'm being more accurate by terminating it that. So we're looking at relative change in dorsal mantle length here on the x-axis over time of year, so just over the breeding season from April to October. And what you see is that we have this sort of approaching a parabolic curve where un, you know, these are all raised under the same conditions. They were adults, squid brought into our system, and then the eggs were all raised at 20 degrees C. We're having this relative decrease in size with the season consistently across years um, that seems to tail off a little bit in autumn. With hatching time, it's actually much more linear, and we see that hatching delays naturally and again, this is something that's surprising because we expect those ectothermic eggs that they're being, their development time is driven by the temperature they're raised in. They're all raised at the same temperature, but we're seeing delays in development time as an effective season, just as a baseline response. And yolk volume is following a fairly similar pattern to dorsal mantle length, where 
This is a little bit weaker by nature of less data, but it suggests starting off pretty high, uh, a drop into the summer, and then tailing off in autumn. And, and these responses were interesting to me. I tried to think what could potentially relate to them. And you'll find that as a person who's sort of a dip toe into ecology person, my first response with environmental proxies is temperature. Um, and it's a good one to go to for ectotherms, for uh, cold-blooded organisms. So if we look at these compared to the curve for vineyard sound sea surface temperature, you can see that for mantle length and yoke volume, these correlate quite strongly. So there's an inverse correlation in size and yoke volume content with ambient temperatures. And again, this is interesting because it wouldn't be surprising if a egg raised at a higher temperature resulted in a smaller larvae. That's normal. That happens. But these were all raised at the same temperature. There's some form of conditioning happening either to the eggs and sperm or to the parents prior to the uh, eggs being laid in our system and reared in our system that is changing the baseline state. So we have these shifting baselines, and we know that we're also seeing these large-scale variabilities. And while showing these trends is compelling, it's not the most robust way to describe this. I can say, well, 2011, 13, and 16 were sensitive years. We saw decreases. 2014 and 2015 were not sensitive years. But this is one metric. I looked at much more than one metric. And we needed a better way to quantify this. You'll find this is a theme in my dissertation broadly, but I like to use or develop methods that go from sort of observational to quantifying. Um, so we're trying to discriminate and really confirm these patterns that we're seeing, and then start to compare and synthesize across metrics as well. Um, so to do that, I used this metric called respo a response ratio. And essentially, a response ratio is something used in a lot of meta-analyses. It's a way to compare effect size. It scales effect size. So the calculation for that is quite simple. It is the mean of your treatment condition over the mean of your control condition. And you just take the logarithm of that, the natural logarithm of that ratio. And that provides you this scaled effect size. And if you have them for multiple trials, you can get a mean and a confidence interval. And as long as that confidence interval doesn't uh, overlap with zero, you have a significant uh, effect of your stressor. Um, and so over the course of four years, I've done a lot of CO2 levels. But in all experiments, including the preliminary work, we always use 2200, as well as some form of ambient or 400 parts per million control. So for the rest of this chapter, we're looking at only those data. And we can use response ratios to kind of more cleanly present them, uh, particularly as they translate very well to sort of percent changes. So here we have our response ratio for our dorsal mantle length on the top and our hatching time on the bottom over our years. And you can see our 2011, 2013, and 2016 have our decreases in mantle length, our increase in hatching time, as we described. But it's got that clear significant difference from that dotted line zero. So we can more efficiently say they're significantly responding in those years and not in 2014 and 2015. Um, but you can also say from this, you know, in 2013, we have an approximate 5% decrease in mantle length. And that allows you to sort of more quickly visualize OK, what could that mean for the survival of these paralarvae? Will that make a significant difference? And so now we have this metric. Let's start digging into those seasonal responses, right? We want to see if those changes that we're kind of anecdotally describing pop out more robustly. And so what I'm showing you now is, again, relative change. So we're relative to the year looking at our change in uh, mantle length response. So they're basically a shift in response intensity over the season. And what you see is that we have more negative responses at the tails of the season. So in our sort of April, May area and in our September, October area, we're having more relatively strong responses. Those are typically driven by extreme uh, individual trials. So we have, again, a need for more robust data set here. But it's compelling to think about. And when you compile it, if you bin it, by months to sort of make it a little bit more cleaner than this individual data. So this has been as May, June, July, and August, September. You can see we don't see a significant change in response over the season, but the variability in that response tends to increase at the beginning and end of our squid breeding season. Now, yolk volume follows a fairly similar trend to mantle length, so I'm not going to show it here, but 
uh, hatching time actually shows that linear response. And again, this is linear response. Uh, this linear increase is a response to acidification. So on top of that baseline increase in hatching time, we're having a significant increase in response to acidification as the season goes on as well. So there's a lot of complexity happening here, but the point is, again, we see our most compelling results kind of at the tails of our season where we have a significant increase in hatching time response in August, September, and we have much higher variability in May, June for that metric. So something not necessarily consistently is happening in every season, but something about the ends of the season tends to be a little bit more variable, a little bit more sensitive than the core, which is interesting because the core of our season, the height of summer, is when we're having our kind of smaller, less uh, yoked paralarvae. Um, but we really wanted to find a way to kind of compile all of those metrics, really look at overall responses and all the observations that we did, and see if we weight data you know, by trial and see all of the different responses, do they cluster by year? Do they cluster by time of year or season? Do these patterns that we're seeing emerge? One of the better ways to do that is a principal components analysis. So here we have principal components analysis of the data, and it covers about 80% of the variation. And so what this essentially means, if you're not familiar with this, is just that points that are close together tend to relate in some way. And the axes, the arrows here, just show uh, how the points are being driven in space by these different metrics. And so we don't really see any clear grouping by year. What we rather see is sort of these lamina or, or layers for each year that are coming across and spreading kind of over this hatching time uh, dorsal mantle length axis. So they're spreading out in terms of annual dispersion due to our dorsal mantle length response and our hatching time response. What we're seeing in terms of variability within a year is uh, dispersion or spread along that yoke volume hatching success comparative. So something about that is changing the way they respond within a, within a year, within a breeding season. And we can add the numbers here represent months. So five is May, six is June, seven July and see is there some sort of consistent clustering or patterns that relate to time of year. And broadly, not really. Again, you see, besides the fact that I sampled a lot in July, um, that potentially some of these September trials are pushing off a bit. Maybe there's some increased sensitivity um, or distinct responses in the tails of the season. But broadly, the variation within this just seems to be clutch to clutch, um, suggesting that it's more driven by parentage. We know, though, from the yoke volume baseline data that yoke volume is influenced by season. And so what we might have here is not enough data to really pull seasonal trends, especially if I, at any point, picked a particular mother or had a particular mother in my system that produced a particularly well conditioned or yoked uh, uh, clutch of eggs. So there might be sort of a confluence of those two things that requires more data to really pull apart. But it's interesting to see the relationship between these metrics, which I hadn't really known before, and think about investigating them as it relates to these time scales, right? So we have hatching time and mantle length acting on annual scales. We have yoke volume and hatching success potentially acting on seasonal scales. And so we can plot those data so here we have mantle length response ratio on the y-axis. We have hatching time on the x-axis. And you can see that they do correlate quite strongly. Um, and what's even more interesting is if we consider what we would call our sensitive system, right? Our decrease in mantle length and our increase in hatching time, or this quadrant here, that all of the points that are in that box are from our 2011, 2013, and 2016 sampling years. And our resistant 14 and 15 fall out of that space. Uh, so we really have a strong indication here that sensitivity in these metrics is operating on an annual scale. Um, right? That's a reminder to myself. Um, now, I've had it suggested to me uh, by a committee member um, 
that some of what might be driving variability in the responses that we're seeing in these metrics owes to, and it relates to those baseline state changes, where we're starting from. If you have larger paralarvae to begin with, and they're stressed, you have a larger space from which to drop in order to um, elicit that response. So bigger paralarvae in a control condition might have stronger responses in a stress condition just because they have farther to go, right? So the question then is, are these points from these sensitive years our biggest paralarvae? Are they the, the ones that we would expect to show those particularly significant drop-offs? And the answer is no. Actually, we see the opposite. So these years have particularly small paralarvae compared to our resistant years, suggesting that these are actually just um, overall slightly more poorly conditioned uh, clutches of eggs that are therefore more sensitive to these environmental stressors. If we look at uh, yolk volume and hatching success, we have hatching success on the y-axis here, we have yolk volume on the x, and this is again a very strong correlation, however it's ignoring this one 2016 point at the bottom left uh, as an outlier because hatching success is quite variable by nature of occasional just full uh, die-offs of an egg capsule if they deoxygenate. Um, so ignoring that, we have a strong correlation, but we don't see that same annual patterning. We don't see a quadrant where any particular year is grouping out or popping out. It's a pretty equal spread. And so again, trying to kind of piece together what's happening here, because we see a trend where consumption of more yolk under stress is causing greater hatching success, what might be driving that? And so, inspired by that mantle length point, I looked at what was the yolk volume in the hatching of the lowest or control condition for these paralarvae. And you can see that in that greater consumption of yolk, greater hatching success quadrant, we have paralarvae from our control condition hatching with more yolk, suggesting, though not confirming, a greater maternal investment um, from the get-go. Um, so this is a situation where uh, as long as maternal investment is high enough, they have the resources to tap into to deal with that homeostatic stress, and we have a greater hatching success as a result. Um, but again, we don't see those annual patterns as yolk tends to be something that seems to vary on a maternal or seasonal scale. So kind of compiling all of this, we see that we had those small scale processes that were affecting sensitivity and variability in response, but we also have these very large scale temporal processes that are impacting acidification, sensitivity and response. And we have certain metrics, mantle length and hatching time, our proxies for growth and development, that are being driven by year class, some sort of annual process. And we have metrics, our yolk volume and our hatching success, that are driven by maternity potentially conflating with season due to changes in the baseline state, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, we also want to start thinking about where these influences could be coming from. And again, I, I tend to lean on temperature as a good environmental proxy. Um, and so just to start moving into a hypothetical space, I'm not gonna, this next part is not making any strong claims about the direct influences that are causing this, but rather to start playing in the space with the data that we have and thinking about where these patterns might emerge from. Uh, I'm gonna show you just a, a exercise that I've been working on in terms of correlating these data to environmental uh, history. So these are the same dose response data for each individual trial. Uh, the response ratio of the mantle length, but now it's over the entire timeline, so we're looking at individual trials. And this is a nice way to look at the data, just because you can kind of look at trends and you can see our shift from our sensitive to our resistant and our sensitive again, um, and see some of the like seasonal variability, that potential uh, sensitive at the start of 2013, sensitive at the end of 2016, that might explain some of that variability in the seasonal responses that we were uh, observing. Um, and we can plot this against the new sound temperature anomaly uh, over this entire time period. And, and the reason I do this is because one of the things I noticed over the course of my experimentation uh, in this uh, system was that we had a tendency to have warm winters preceding my sensitive years. And now, again, this is a very 
rough observation, a rough metric. There could be a number of direct and indirect reasons why environmental sea surface temperature could translate down to the squid who are you know, offshore in deep waters for winter. But you can see how our positive temperature anomalies are 2013 and our 2012 were preceding my 2013 experiments. And that really hard spike in 2016 was preceding my uh, 2016 experiments. So I wanted to see how these data kind of lined up. And if we correlate these data, so now we have mantle length response ratio over our uh, two-year average temperature anomaly, because we have to remember the squid population that's breeding here is not just one-year-olds. There are occasionally two-year-olds. So to get a real picture of what that environmental history will be, just as a broad aggregate, we're combining the previous two years into one average value for overwintering temperatures. And you can see here, this is a weak correlation, but it suggests that increased temperature anomalies is causing or related to uh, greater decreases or greater sensitivity to acidification in this metric. But it's just not enough data. It would really require a much more robust time series to make any stronger claims. And we don't know enough about how the squid are spending their time when they're offshore to really know how these influences might be translating through. But I wanted to see if there was a way to shore this up a little bit more, make this system a little bit more robust. And the cephalopody community in Woods Hole is aware, very anecdotally, that not only, well, I'm aware that the paralarvae change, but the adults also change over the course of the season. They're known to be much larger in the early part of the breeding season. They get smaller at the height of summer, and then they get larger again, tailing off into the fall. This has been roughly described, or is just known, among the scientists who work with cephalopods here. Um, but there was a model presented in 1977 that suggested this succession of size classes was actually sort of a, uh, a means of population structuring in this system. And so it's not the most robust thing to use, but it's what we have. And I'm just using it as a framework here. So under the definitions of this model, uh, from May through July, we have a potential mix of two-year-olds and one-year-olds. But from August on, we only have squid that were hatched in the previous year when it only had been exposed to one previous uh, overwintering. And so if we change our correlation to describe that, so we have our cold uh, 2015, we have our hot winter in 2016, so we combine that for our uh, early trials, and then we only use the year prior for our late trials, that fits the observations that we're seeing much more strongly. Um, so we have a significant correlation here in our response ratio over our previous winter's temperature anomaly when we're accounting for this possible succession in the population, the breeding population. Now, again, this could be me biasing for my viewpoint and the, the extreme values that I'm seeing in my system. It could very easily be not a linear response, but a stepwise where we just have that sort of cloud of variability in terms of sensitivity and resistance, and we have particularly extreme winters causing extreme responses in one-year-olds uh, that are producing offspring. It's hard to say for sure, but it's compelling. Uh, and it's something that suggests the environment is influencing sensitivities in a way that hadn't been described previously, um, but would warrant much further, more robust investigation to really shore up. So if we kind of synthesize on this chapter, oh boy, time is not good for me. Um, we see that environmental variability potentially influences offspring sensitivity, particularly on mantle length. We're seeing annual variations that are quite strong. And we want to start thinking about what this could mean for the survival of the paralarvae and shifts in population structure under climate change. But we don't necessarily have the scope to discuss that in my dissertation. It's just a good platform to go through this work in the future. Um, what it does suggest is that temperature and acidification play together in this system and affect sensitivities in this system in a way that we hadn't really examined yet in our squid. And so we wanted to examine if warming, like it has in other taxa, uh, amplified acidification impacts, uh, particularly as we were having many years where we weren't seeing anything. So we're adding temperature to the system, and we're looking to see if temperature modulates sensitivity on that small scale. We're coming back to this embryonic development system in the same way that it does, or in a similar way, as it appears to on the large scale. 
And so I want to reintroduce the Lully Global Garris system, the ROSA study that I mentioned before, which not only raised these squid under acidification, but also two degrees warming. And what they saw in this system was that they did see amplification. The effect sizes were greatest under combined stress. And so we want to ask, is that happening in our squid as well? And we saw, or they saw, that responses, again, varied between their seasonal cohorts. So again, they had summer resistant squid, uh, summer sensitive squid and winter resistant squid to both of these stressors. And we want to see what kind of variability we see in response to our stressors across our breeding season. So in terms of doing this work in Vineyard Sound, I've said before that our, if we're looking at the breeding season, our average temperature is 20 degrees C, which is why we use that to rear our squid. That's our seasonal mean. Our peak temperature is typically around 25. And so if we're really trying to stress the system, we can go two degrees above peak or 27 degrees Celsius. And so that's the uh, warming temperature that we use for this experiment. So it's a similar setup to what we had prior. We have two water baths now at the 20 and 27 degrees that have been the eggs when introduced to the system are acclimated at one degree every two hours. We have uh, three PCO2 levels, so we have our 400 and we have our 2200, but 22 is now our variable, right? We don't know if they're gonna respond there. So we've introduced 3500 as a positive control. They're going to respond to that much acidification. Uh, we confirmed that in previous years. Um, the other major difference in the study is that we have one mother per trial and we have one egg capsule per cup. So now we're limiting parentage variability as much as humanly possible. <laughs> Uh, there's still complex fathership, but I'm certain of the maternity in each trial. Each trial has a new mother, and I can look at variability between siblings, or sibling egg capsules, at least half sibling egg capsules. So we ran three trials like this in 2016, and I added a new measurement of malformations, because they became much more prominent here, which are good proxy for survival of the hatchling paralarvae. So if we dive into this, we can see our mantle length on our y-axis, our CO2 on our x-axis, and we're looking at our 20 degrees C response. And we see no response at 2200, so we have a acidification resistant clutch, but our positive control is functioning. If we add temperature to the system, we don't see much difference. There's a little bit of a jitter at 2200, but it's not significant. And again, our positive control is working, but we're not seeing any impacts of temperature, and we're not seeing impacts of acidification at that 2200 level, which is our kind of focus point. If we compare that to our September trial, we see a linear decrease in size with increasing acidification. So our 2200 uh, level is responding. They're acidification sensitive here. And if we look at our warming response, there's a much stronger response to warming. We're seeing a really dominant decrease in mantle length as a result of the warming. And the interesting thing is we're not seeing a translation of that decrease from acidification down because of warming. We're seeing warming just drop the size of the paralarvae, suggesting either it's swamping out acidification impacts or the paralarvae are maybe hitting a size floor for viable hatching. Uh, but in either case, we're having the greatest effect size in our, our, uh, by warming when we have a sensitive clutch. So, we're gonna dig really quickly into those sibling to sibling differences. So we have here is just the distribution of mantle lengths within each egg capsule. So each line is an individual egg capsule within a treatment condition, so this is our control. And so you see that in this case, our mantle lengths are pretty consistent. Our distribution across our eggs is pretty consistent between these sibling egg capsules. If we raise acidification a little bit, we don't see any real disruption to those distributions. We see a shift in the mean, suggesting stress, but the responses are pretty similar. But when we really crank up the stress, then those responses start to diverge. We start seeing, um, even under temperature as well, uh, flattening of the curves, like wider curves, or just wider response range from the egg capsules, suggesting that maternity sort of setting our baseline response, our outcome, but under extreme stress, we start seeing those divergent uh, responses that are some form of adaptive kind of bet hedging under stressful conditions. That was really fast, but I'm gonna keep going. Um, so looking at hatching success data, this is a plot you may not be super familiar with. This is a spider plot. So the way these work 
is on our axes here, we have our categories. So I'm categorizing hatching success by whether the paralarvae actually hatched. Uh, if the embryos stop developing in early stages, if they stop developing in middle stages, or if they stop developing in late stage. And these are embryonic stages provided by Arnold, so that's one through 30. But the actual like, separation of these categories is primarily visual discrimination, um, just for easy uh, processing. It's not like an established thing in the field. Um, and so the way these plots work is each of these rings will represent a percentage. And so if we presume to have 100% hatch and an equal distribution between these categories, what we would see is a distribution like this where the lines are our means and we have 25% in each category and then that cloud of blue is the error. So if we look at real data, we can see that under control condition, our 20 degrees C and our 400 parts per million, we have pretty much an entire successful hatch. We have a few losses in early embryos. Sometimes they don't get fertilized or they just don't develop, but mostly a good hatch. When we add acidification, we start shifting into greater loss of late stage embryos. And as we increase acidification, that trend continues. So it appears that acidification is impacting development more in the later stages. Whereas when we look at warming, that script flips and we see a much more uh, strong loss of early embryos. Uh, and an interesting thing is, as opposed to most times where warming either swamps out or dampens acidification impacts, this is one of the few occasions where if you can see the solid to increasing hash lines being the increasing acidification and warming, that maybe acidification and warming are amplifying loss of early stage embryos. Um, so we're shifting the pattern that way. This suggests that warming, unsurprisingly, impacts embryonic development right away. It affects the metabolic and developmental processes and the rate at which they happen, whereas acidification sort of builds up over time and may not stress until quite late. If we look at similar data, but for those malformations, now we're categorizing as normal hatched paralarvae. We have premature paralarvae, so we've talked about that internal yolk. Premature paralarvae still have external yolk. Um, and it's been shown that these are unlikely to survive in the wild, as the transition to feeding is very important. Uh, a condition I'd call eye bulge, which is just the increase in the membrane around the eyes, uh, which can get quite extreme, can almost look like a space helmet. Uh, and then a malformation of the head or body that I just overall categorize as malformed head, because it's the most dominant uh, version. So if we dive into these data, what we see is that under our control conditions, we typically have a strong, normal hatch. Um, as we increase acidification, we start increasing the amount of premature and eye bulge condition. As we ramp up acidification, we really see more premature and eye bulge condition. And then as we add uh, warming, we have a slight dampening of both of those acidification impacts and a slight increase in our malformation. So again, here we have a system where warming appears to be acting antagonistically to acidification rather than amplifying it. And so we need to ask, where might that antagonistic relationship come from? And the one thing I haven't really talked about is development time. Uh, so under acidification, our, this is a cumulative percent hatching curve, so we're just looking at how many paralarvae hatched over time from the point that they were laid. So that's our control curve. As we increase acidification, that gets delayed. We've seen that in all of our uh, previous work. But when we raise them under our warming condition, we have that dynamic shift, that increase in development time because it's higher temperature and they're just processing things much faster. But we also have a dampening of that acidification again. And so the sort of reverse way to look at this is not only are they developing faster, but they're spending less time under acidification, under our warming condition. And so you can sort of equate faster development to a decreased acidification exposure. That might explain why we see these antagonistic responses. So just summarizing here, we have warming typically dampening acidification, probably because it's reducing the amount of time the eggs are spending under acidification, particularly as acidification seems to be kind of slow burn that affects later development. And we got to see that there's some consistency in response to stress for eggs under the same, uh, eggs from the same mother, but that response is diversify under extreme stress. Um, so just to wrap, 
a little bit here. We saw in our first chapter, chapter two, we see variability on a small scale, in sensitive years, um, cross hatching days and season. We can scale that up to seeing environmental conditioning potentially impacting sensitivities on annual and seasonal scales. Um, and if we come back down to our sort of embryonic development, we see that acidification tends to build up over time. It's a late stage stressor. Warming is an immediate impact on development, so it's an immediate stressor and also reduces acidification by reducing that exposure time. And I just want to point out, all of this data is only really possible because I ran these experiments for four years as part of a PhD. A lot of organismal global change work is done in a single year. It's done as sort of a one shot to see how an organism responds. And it's really important that we come to understand the need for replication, the need to understand variability in our organisms and, and how that relates to the population structure of our specific system. Um, I am out of time, so I'm gonna jump past this. Um, broadly, I'll point out this adaptivity, this, uh, this potential shifting between sensitivity and resistance is not unexpected in cephalopods and our group of here, benthopelagic cephalopods, so our, they live near the bottom of the shelf but they swim around uh, squids, um, are generally increasing abundance, in abundance under global change. This is thought to be because they can diversely adapt and respond and the population, because it's a year class species, uh, year class taxa, can kind of quickly shift. Um, so the responses we see are not overtly surprising in the context of CEPHs. Um, gonna skip future directions and just wrap here. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Five minutes for questions. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Brett. Uh, so no, uh, this is a good question. So Brett's asking what the conditions of the females that I brought into the lab were uh, prior to them laying the eggs. And so, in the preliminary study, they were kept at 20, the same as the, um, so they were transitioned into 20 degrees sea water, the same as what the eggs would be in. I transitioned that to keeping them at 15, um, because we started off with a pretty high density of squid in the tanks, which might have been an issue unto itself, but it, at that temperature, the metabolism was so high that they tended to like fight each other a lot, and we wouldn't get eggs because they would just damage each other too much. So I, I brought that down to 15. So the adults were taken from the boat, driven up to ESL. They were put into 15 degree sea water and then transitioned into, the eggs were transitioned into the 20. The acidification was always at 20. You're asking if we exposed the parents to the acidification, if that might have conditioned the offspring differently? Uh, I mean, that has been seen in fish, uh, so estuarine fish that are um, seasonally exposed to different acidification, the parents seasonally exposed to different acidification levels, have offspring with different acidification sensitivities, so that sort of epigenetic response is seen in, in fishes. It hasn't been described in cephalopods. Josh's lab that does this RNA editing work and this rapid adaptivity might be one to do that. That would be hard to do with Doritoothus PLI for reasons that you're fully aware of, but it's not an easy system to culture. Um, hopefully one of the squid that you're culturing we could do that with, because it would be great to do transgenerational exposures and see if we can pull out the mechanisms of these epigenetic responses. But cephalopod epigenetics is like lagging much farther behind cephalopod genetics, which is only recently kind of booming. Rosemary. Also a really good question. How do you tell a difference between a two-year-old and a one-year-old? 
uh, roughly size, as they would be much bigger, but accurately, you could pull the statoliths and count the rings to get a rough, at least relative difference, whether or not, I don't think we know the statolith ring deposition rate for this species. Do we? I don't think so. Um, so we wouldn't get a precise age, but they'd be substantially different between a one-year-old and a two-year-old at the very least. So that's when I say that that, like, that model is pretty rough, is it's using size class to define what it's considering two-year-olds versus one-year-olds, and we would really need to do a much more precise study. There's a lot of other work that suggests squid that have one breeding season, like the reef squid in Australia, have like micro cohorts where it's just constant succession of new one-year-olds. That model also kind of implicitly suggests that they're the same population of squid that are going out and coming back, and we haven't confirmed that's a real thing that happens. So there's a lot about that that is still shaky, which is why it is just sort of a broad brush uh, examination of the environment. Yeah, Anna Maria. Yeah, that's an, so if I can like, summarize, Anna Maria is asking if because certain parts of the season are in vineyard sound are more variable environmentally, the tails of that season are, are less consistent, sometimes they're warm, sometimes they're cold, if part of this environmental conditioning is, is almost a bet hedging response. So we would say if the species expects that this time next year is going to be the same as it is now, um, I can kind of invest in my offspring X. Um, that's been sort of hypothetically and theoretically described, mathematical models, not my specialty, for a lot of um, like arthropods, bugs, ectotherms in general. It's thought to be something that a lot of animals do. Uh, it's possible that it's happening here. It's more broadly understood that squid just kind of produce a lot of eggs and, and bet hedge by nature of number and potentially this like adaptability um, as well as the mixed parentage um, scenario as well as potentially the successional population. So I don't know, honestly, if that's happening. I think it's possible, um, but it, we don't understand the epigenetic mechanisms that are allowing for this conference of sensitivity or resistance in the first place. Squid don't like hold on to energy they don't store lipids. So when we're talking about how the parents are conditioning their offspring, um, the state of a, a female is dependent on how much energy she's gathered over her life and how much of that she's chose or the body has invested in reproductive organs versus size, right? And then at the point of producing eggs, it's just a question of how much you're eating at the time that you can transfer into eggs. So. Whereas you might say, if times were scarce or times were plentiful for something like a bear or a bird that can store lipids and, and sort of alter its response based on ambient physiology, squid don't really have that system, but we're still seeing these potential conditionings. And so it's a big open question how that's happening. Um, hope that helped. And any other questions? or I'll move on to acknowledgments if not. Uh, sorry, I went long. I knew I was gonna go long. I had to add a lot more framing to life. Um, I'll try to be quick with acknowledgments. Um, I appreciate the sort of indulgence of acknowledgments in terms of being a practice of reflectance and, and consideration of what has been a large chunk of my life. Um, I'm not the type of person to broadly like open up emotionally in public, so this may be a little bit goofy by nature of me just compensating. Um, but <laughs> um, I think it's a good exercise nonetheless to reflect. I'll try to be brief so that you can all go back to your lives. Um, 
I do want to start by acknowledging that we are currently on Wampanoag lands, so we are occupiers of indigenous lands, um, and we have taken over stewardship in a large part of those lands. And part of what I want to say here in trying to do a land acknowledgement, which I've never done before, is we have a responsibility to, as the descendants of or just current occupiers of this land and space, um, think about our relationship to the indigenous peoples that once and continue to exist in this space and how we can work with them to steward it better. And so we really do have a responsibility in a history and science to think about our relationship with indigeneity. Science in particular has had some problems with indigeneity. Um, and so if you're not familiar, the Mashpee Wampanoag are currently fighting to uh, preserve their sovereignty over lands. It's been under threat with the government for months now that it's passed the House, um, but is now moving into the Senate. And so literally just engaging with a hashtag, we're thinking about yeah, looking up news stories about this, you live in this space, we all work in this space, it's important to think about what that means and how it impacts the people that were here before us. Um, and in particular, that relationship has become prominent with the Mauna Kea um, Observatory conflict, which is another system that hopefully you're familiar with, but if you're not, uh, scientists are currently trying to develop uh, holy or sacred lands on Mauna Kea and are uh, currently in conflict with indigenous native Hawaiians who want to preserve that land as sacred space. And so we really have to start thinking about the importance of grappling with the scientific history and its relationship with indigenous peoples and trying to be better uh, in maintaining that relationship. And so one thing that I like to do, or I'm trying to do better myself, is be an ally and learn how to be an ally. And so this is a podcast that I listen to that I really like. It's just an easy opening space to think about it. This are two very intelligent uh, indigenous women who talk about their relationship to colonization. Uh, and they talk about being good kin as a colonizer and thinking about ways to not take over native identity or native space, but support it. Um, and I just want to encourage people to be informed as part of occupying this space. Now, as stewards of the ocean and someone who has run four years of experiment with squid, I feel like it's necessary to also acknowledge the squid. Um, over the course of these experiments, I have worked with 58,985 squid eggs. Um, of those, we counted 49,581 individual para larvae, uh, and that's about 8,500 mantle length pictures that I or people who worked with me had to process among that's one metric of the many that I did. So I was very lucky. The scope of this project was quite intense, but I had a lot of really great help that Aaron was really great at aggregating for me as part of this work. Uh, so I really want to acknowledge uh, their work, research assistants like Andrea Schlunk and Con Worth. And I cannot physically overstate how much Andrea Schlunk is instrumental to this PhD and the degree to which she has made this project and my success in this PhD possible. So highlights for that. But I've also got to mentor several summer fellows, work with MBL Discovery students uh, on a number of projects. I've had field methods interns, guest students, and I've uh, mentored and worked with students at Stonehill College as well. So I've had a really strong opportunity to mentor and work with students in a way that a lot of JP students don't get as part of the scope of this project. And it's been really beneficial to and really wonderful to get to collaborate with all of these people. Um, this is the big credit slide. Um, but a project like this doesn't happen on its own. It happens because Aaron got funding from the NSF. It happens because I got funding from the NSF, um, as well as, as Aaron mentioned, the Hugh Hampton Young and some several other awards. It happens because my committee has been very supportive in helping me, well, trying to constrain me from doing too much. But if it isn't obvious, you can't constrain me from doing too much. <laughs> Um, but I really want to thank them for all of their insights over the years, as well as thank Carolyn for helping organize this defense. I really want to note for people that have provided guidance and advice, Dan McCorkle, who was here and really was instrumental in keeping me going on the right path in the first couple of years, um, as well as facilities and Meg Tyvee, uh, Jim Goder before her, all of the support at academic programs that have helped make this PhD possible, and I, I do greatly appreciate that. Um, I really want to note, and again, you'll see Andrew Schlunk come up a lot, um, 
that Aaron has done a really spectacular job of bringing in great people to the Mooney Lab, and it's been a really fun lab to be a part of. I came in at about the same time as these three people, Andrew, Anne, Marie, and Tammy, all of whom are here, uh, and we survived that first year and worked together. Um, there's too many people that are all amazing in this lab, but I do want to note a couple specific people that either helped at the project or just were sort of friends and cohort over this time. Um, I also want to thank Aaron and really think about mentors more broadly. I really respect, as someone who's now had to be a mentor a lot, the, the effort and the investment in mentorship. A lot of the book that will eventually come out about whales is secretly about mentorship. Um, <laughs> um, so again, I want to thank Aaron for his patience and his support in all of the crazy things that I do and helping me develop as a scientist. I want to acknowledge Mike Behrman, who was my master's advisor, and when I got this opportunity and I was halfway around the world from it, was like, yes, go, it's hooey. You do get to work with Squid. Um, and gave up you know, me working on projects for him to allow me to come here as a master's student. And really excellent undergrad advisors at Florida Gulf Coast University that have supported me in all of the crazy things that I do. Um, mentors don't always come in these direct forms. Uh, I really want to note, uh, I hope they're still here, but they might have bounced, uh, the efforts of Antaren and Becky Gast, who really helped me survive burnout, uh, not just because they were either education coordinator or, or the department chair, but because they're just excellent human beings that really helped keep me in this program and keep me on track. Um, in the early years in particular, postdocs then, now professors of their own right, Karen Chan and Amy Moss, were really strong supports in helping me do acidification work and just giving me guidance on how to be a PhD student. Um, and I really want to note the excellent cohort of students that I've got to be a part of and be friends with as part of the Huey Biology program. Uh, Emily Moberg was sort of my pseudo JP advisor. Um, we became friends at a conference and then I've continued and then I had I started in February, so I had the benefit of being sort of pseudo part of two cohorts with Megan, Hanny, and Jenny, and now Laura and Deepa. And there's just all utterly excellent people that have really helped make this great. Um, I want to note my excellent comic book friends, Maris Wicks and Rosemary Moscow, who are here. Getting the opportunity to meet with them regularly, talk about science communication, talk about uh, comics in general has been great just in keeping me sane but also I grew up also interested in art unsurprisingly uh, of the many things and always kind of dreamed of this idea of having a community of people and like fantasizing about like early France and art and people meeting in cafes and discussing ideas in this academic artsy sense and I've gotten to live that for six years because of these people so yay emotions in public <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Um, I also want to note Abby Howard, who I've more recently started working with on that tactile comic book. Um, and it's, it's hopefully relevant in this comic that she made. It's just so wonderful to meet people who get you and like see the world in similar ways. And I will have the tactile comic out in the lobby uh, to check out the current prototype if you're interested in that. Um, I've gotten the opportunity to do science communication with a bunch of great people at Huey. They're not all listed here, but the broader impacts group. And through tabling, I want to give a shout out to hopefully still watching Sarah McAnulty, who is the head of Skype a Scientist, which is a program that if you do not currently participate in, you should be participating in, because it's a really easy and wonderful way to do outreach. Um, but she is also a squid biologist and science communicator, and it's been a great ally to just survive with in the last several years. And uh, people who have participated in or worked with me or just do great activism here and abroad at Huey, um, particularly Chrissy and, and Leopi's lab, as well as Glow and Dak. But we live in a time where we have to reckon with the responsibility academia has had in developing the systems of injustice that still persist on large scales and small scales in our country. And part of making those changes on a large scale is making those changes in our backyard, in our home, uh, small scale. And I, I wish I had done more of that here, but I'm really heartened that Chrissy and Ishan and Paris and all of these great people who are doing more of that work here are really showing like, distinct change in making Huey better. Um, I like to escape 
into nerd media, so I feel like it's really worthwhile to point out that these sorts of things, these podcasts and, and YouTube video series really keep me alive. They really keep me sane. And if you have not been watching the Bon Appetit Test Kitchen videos on YouTube, <laughs> you desperately need to, as they, they're just joy encapsulated. Part of that escapism has been for the last like two and a half years, my Dungeons and Dragons group, the stories that I do. So that's involving my best friend of more than 10 years, Siri, who is currently my housemate, um, Andrea as well, and then a bunch of other people that I've had the pleasure of building crazy worlds and crazy stories and dangerous monsters and then bakeries that they decide to destroy, just various insane things that, again, were my breathers and my relaxation from what could be the stresses of, of this PhD. Um, my family managed to come, which was a surprise. So my mom and my grandmother are here, and they're on their way up to this place in Maine, which I will soon escape to when I am done. Um, we're not a picture-taking family, so I don't have a lot of pictures of us. Um, but uh, this is sort of where we congregate and like reset every year, and so I'm excited for that. My grandparents were world explorers, and so I I uh, want to acknowledge how much they instilled in me a love of exploration. And then my mom has been my greatest supporter, period. <laughs> if there's any reason that I do a million crazy things, it's because she always told me that I could and that I was capable of it. So, thank you. Um, the last thing I want to end on is my great desire to bookend. If you hadn't noticed in the talk, I really like bookending as a structure. So this is me in 2013, the first summer that I was here, and I dyed my hair red as part of the stress of the situation. This is Marianne, my summer fellow. And so I wanted to end the way I began in this PhD. Uh, and again, thank you for the indulgence and the time. Oh.